It's you I like. Every part of you. There's nobody else in the whole world like you. And I like you just the way you are. If you grew up in the United States, you probably already know that core message of kindness from the PBS kids show, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. If you grew up watching the program, you probably have a story about what Mr. Rogers meant to you. From 1968 to 2001, Fred Rogers talked to American preschoolers about starting kindergarten, sibling rivalry, divorce, and even death. Anything they might experience and have feelings about growing up. It seems like over the last couple of years, we've all started collectively remembering Mr. Rogers. He's gotten a lot of attention and tributes. The biography, The Good Neighbor by Maxwell King, the documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor, the podcast, Finding Fred, hosted by Carvel Wallace, and the biopic, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, starring Tom Hanks. Now, a lot more people have a fuller picture of who Mr. Rogers was as a person. You probably know by now that he was basically the same person off camera as on. You know that his core message, I like you as you are, compelled him to take a stand on civil rights. See the 1969 episode when he soaked his feet in the same pool as Officer Clemens. You know he was an ordained Presbyterian minister. He believed his mission to help kids with their feelings was a sacred one. He composed all the music for the program. He supervised all the scripts and operated most of the puppets. He was one of the first to lobby Congress in support of funding public media. He studied with some of the founders in the field of child development, Margaret McFarland, Eric Erickson, and Dr. Spock. The general sentiment from all the Mr. Rogers tributes seems to be that Mr. Rogers is really relevant to the grown-up world right now. And what they're talking about is politics, right? I mean, I like you just the way you are is a message about kindness and empathy and the inherent value of human life. It seems like a lot of people see Mr. Rogers as a kind of anti-Trump. These aren't people. These are animals. His wife, Joanne, came right out and said it. His values are very, very different from Fred's values. Almost completely opposite. You could imagine Fred Rogers actually coming out and speaking up about that? Amy? I think he might have to. Really? That would be political. But if Mr. Rogers is going to inform our resistance to white supremacy and xenophobia and Trump, I think we need to take a closer look at what he was actually saying. Is bringing about change in the world as simple as that core nugget of wisdom, liking people just the way they are? To answer that question, I think we need to shift our focus a little from Mr. Rogers the person to his life's work, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, the program. Okay, so the initial conceit for this video was to find an episode and do a sort of close reading of it. We talk about the characters, the pacing, and all of the technical elements and how they connect to communicate a message. That way we'd have a better sense of what that message was. And then we'd use our newfound wisdom to bring about justice. I did my best to choose an episode that was about something grown up and political. It's called A Visit to a Dairy Farm, and it's about working and making money. Sounds great, right? But as I was researching this video, I discovered another layer of complexity. That Dairy Farm episode was from 1984. The reruns from the 80s and 90s are the episodes that I grew up with. But after a bit of googling, I came across the very first week of programs from when Mr. Rogers went national in 1968. The format hadn't fully evolved yet, and some of the writing and characterization is different from what I was used to. And those differences painted a dramatically different picture of the grown-up world. So here's the plan. We'll watch the Dairy Farm episode, and then we'll watch a few clips from that first week in 1968. We'll talk about what's different, and what we can take away from those differences to figure out what Mr. Rogers is actually trying to tell us about the messed up world we live in. So come along as we pop our videotape into picture picture and watch A Visit to a Dairy Farm. Right off the bat, the theme song is pretty unusual, right? It's surprisingly gentle. Compare that to other kids' shows theme songs, even the ones on PBS. Here's Arthur. Here's Cyber Chase. They start right away with more forward instruments, vocals or drums, trying to get the kids pumped up. But not here. Also notice that in those other themes, you start seeing characters do things right away. 
But Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood starts with stillness, the slow pan across the model neighborhood, then you see the inside of the television house with the not-so-subtle symbolism of the flashing yellow light. We're more than 30 seconds into the program before we even see Mr. Rogers coming through the door. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day. He's got a lot to do during this sequence. Taking off the jacket, zipping up the sweater, green today, changing the shoes. But do you notice what he does towards the end of the song? He slows things down even more. Right around the time he sings, let's make the most of this beautiful day, the rhythm just goes away. So, let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're Talk about the words matching the music. We really are making the most of every moment here. Every element of this opening sequence is designed to help us feel patient and focused. Won't you please, please won't you be my neighbor, neighbor. After the theme song, Mr. Rogers shows us what he's brought for us today. He brings a different object in every episode, and today it's a piece of string. Sometimes he'll use the object to start a larger conversation, but today we're just doing Cat's Cradle. You'll notice a lot of close-ups all through this episode, starting here with the string and continuing on at the dairy farm. But they're not exactly what you would imagine close-ups to be. They're not of people's faces like in a movie. It feels more like we're observing things in our environment the way a small child might. We stare at them for a long time, and we watch them move and change. Even the music helps us focus on this. Notice how the piano matches the action on the screen? <laughs> it's kind of like a calmer version of what happens in a cartoon like The Sorcerer's Apprentice from Fantasia. The object usually leads Mr. Rogers into his first song. Today, the string leads into maybe one of my favorite Mr. Rogers songs. It's about how being curious and wondering how things work is an okay thing. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know that it's all right to wonder? Did you know that it's all right to wonder? There are all kinds of wonderful things. The bridge of the song goes like this. You can ask a lot of questions about the world and your place in it. You can the world and your place in it. Today we're going to learn about how grown-ups work and make money, but we're also going to learn about a child's place in that system, and there will be plenty of time for our thoughts and feelings along the way. Then Mr. Rogers gets a phone call from Jane at the neighborhood dairy farm. We never transition between scenes without some kind of an explanation. Mr. Rogers made a point of showing kids how things in their lives, whether it's milk or crayons or stamps or toilets, were put together. Not only is this something kids might be curious about, it also gets them thinking about what different workplaces look like and what kinds of grown-up jobs they might have someday. In a lot of the later episodes, the delivery man, Mr. McFeely, comes over with a videotape about how people make X and graciously stays with Mr. Rogers and watches it with him. Today, though, we actually get to visit the farm in person. So, do you notice the music that's playing during this transition? It's Did You Know, the same song from before. The jazz combo, led by pianist Johnny Costa, takes the tunes and improvises on them so that across an episode you hear the same songs in new ways. That parallels the rest of the program. It introduces a theme and builds onto it little by little. Now we're at the farm and Mr. Rogers gives us an extremely Mr. Rogers moment when he says hello to a cow. Hello. He introduces us to his friend Jane and makes sure she says hello to us. I'd like you to know my television neighbor. This is Jane Henshaw. In this scene, Mr. Rogers kind of becomes a surrogate for his audience. The questions he asks are the kinds of questions that a preschooler might have in mind. Do they like to be milked? I don't think they mind at all. Notice how Jane and Anne, the herdswoman, are extremely patient when they answer him. In the Mr. Rogers episodes that I grew up with, the adults are almost universally calm and patient, even when his questions are repetitive or kind of ridiculous from an adult perspective. Well, now this isn't part of the cow, is it? No, this is a jar that holds the milk when it comes out of the cow. 
The message here is that there are adults in the world patient enough to take kids' questions seriously, and the kids who don't have adults in their lives who are so patient with them will find that here. Then, when they walk into the cold storage room, something interesting happens. Mr. Rogers kind of code switches between being a surrogate for kids' thoughts and teaching us something grown up. He introduces an idea he wants to return to later in the episode. This whole thing must cost a lot of money, Jane. Oh, it does. Equipment is very expensive. Later on, we'll hear a lot more about money and how adults earn it and choose to spend it, but Mr. Rogers introduces the subject here just to get it into our heads. As someone who does interviews, I'm actually really impressed with how smoothly he brings this up in a conversation that's otherwise unrelated. When you own your own business, it's very expensive, all those items. Yeah, I can imagine. But it's very pleasing also. Uh Now for the second big block of the program, the neighborhood of make-believe. This is the part where the trolley visits King Friday's castle, and Daniel Tiger's clock, and X and Henrietta's tree, and all the human characters walk around and sort through all the puppets' drama. Before we make this trip into make-believe, Mr. Rogers gives us an idea of what we're going to be make-believing about. We've been make-believing that the weather has been hot in the pretend neighborhood, and King Friday has decided- He's making it clear that what we're doing here is pretending. You can even see him bending over to move the switches that control the trolley. There's no mystery here about how the trolley is moving, and that the story we're about to see is made up. Today in Make Believe, there's an A story and a B story. We start with the B story. Anna Platypus is all ready to go on a picnic at the beach with her parents, but she's waiting for her dad, who's a doctor, to get home from work. And then there's the A story. It's been really hot outside all week, and King Friday has decided to use a surplus in the neighborhood budget to build a pool. We meet the contractor, Ellen Paterson, and her partner, who happens to be a beaver, which is totally cool. In an imaginary country I made up as a kid, a cherry tree ran for president. X the Owl is taking a correspondence course about money, and Ellen gives him a real-life lesson about how people work and get paid. Money has a lot to do with work. Because? Because most people get paid money when they work. Oh. But then they broaden the discussion a little. Well, what if you work and don't get paid money? Then you get paid in other ways, like food to eat, or a place to sleep, or even a good feeling about it. The definition of work that they arrive at is really cool. It's inclusive not only of work for pay, but jobs that might be done by a stay-at-home parent, or even a kid doing chores. Kids are permitted to understand the adult world, and even play a part in it in an age-appropriate way. But there is a problem. The pool is going to cost 4500 and the king only has 3000 on hand. Apparently in make-believe the currency isn't dollars or pounds or anything, it's just numbers. The king isn't sure what to do, but Lady Aberlin has an idea. Well, what if we dug the hole? That would save money, wouldn't it? Oh, it would. He's delighted by the suggestion and orders everyone to pitch in to dig the hole for the pool. But Lady Aberlin persuades him to ask people rather than ordering them. King Friday makes the final decisions in the neighborhood of make-believe, but in this scene he's willing to listen and take suggestions. Yes, ask, yes. Help, your father's a doctor. He cannot leave people when they need him. Meanwhile, Anna's dad gets stuck at work, and the platypus family has to reschedule their picnic. Anna's sad about it. To her, it seems like all her dad does is care for his patients, and he never has time to care for her. She talks about this with Lady Aberlin, and Lady Aberlin brings up a point that goes back to that same theme of work. If he could be here, he would be, Anna. Your father cares for you very much. That's why he works so hard. Because he cares for you. Once again, the program is giving us an opportunity to understand the adult world. Grown-ups work to support the people they care about, especially their kids. Lady Aberlin even tries to get Anna's mind off the picnic by inviting her to participate in a grown-up project, digging the hole for the pool. Swimming pool, remember, we really need your help. I do have a shovel. And the bucket. Oh. I'll report to Uncle Friday, and I'll be right back. Okay, bye. 
Once we're back from our trolley ride into make-believe, we feed the fish, and then Mr. Rogers has one more idea for us about working and money. He shows us how to put two empty milk cartons together to make homemade blocks. Sometimes when you go to a store, you see a toy or something that you really would like to have, but you just may not be able to have it. See, many things that children want cost more money than their moms or dads can spend. When that happens to you, maybe you could find things like empty milk cartons and then think of ways to make something from them. It can give you a very good feeling to think up your own toys, your very own toys. We're learning here a little bit more about the division of responsibility that comes with work. The parents decide how to spend the money they've worked to earn. Again, that's part of caring. But kids have a role to play here too. Making your own toys takes disappointment and turns it around into pride. It's such a good feeling, a very good feeling, the feeling you we know. We end the show as we always do with the song Good Feelings, which is a statement in itself. Learning about the world and how you can participate in it makes you feel good. You'll have things you'll want to talk about. I will do. I honestly don't know of any other TV show with quite this format. The mix of documentary and storytelling and talking directly with the viewer. The closest thing I can think of is probably a vlog. Like a vlog, the whole thing is built around central themes or takeaways, so let's review what those are. First of all, adults work in order to care for other people. They can make money from that work, and they can make decisions about how best to spend that money. But adults also listen to suggestions, and kids are allowed to ask about anything grown-up related that confuses them, or to bring up their feelings of sadness or disappointment. There are adults out there who will listen and be patient, and those adults will help you as you grow to participate in the world in a way that is appropriate to your level of development. It seems like Mr. Rogers' goal here is not only to validate our feelings, but to basically explain adulthood to us. So maybe it doesn't seem so scary, and maybe it feels like something we can be excited to participate in one day. Now for a bit of culture shock. We're going to look back at that first week of episodes from 1968. This isn't the first time Mr. Rogers was ever on television, but this is the first time he hosted a program called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood on national U.S. television. Things start out similar enough, with the same theme song and the sweater and everything, although Mr. Rogers is obviously a lot younger, and he is wearing a trench coat? He's just as calm and patient as he is in the later episodes, but he does act a bit differently. He feels less like a teacher and more like a friend. In the second episode, for example, the only direct instructions he gives kids are about safety. Plastic bag is something we get rid of right away. No play with plastic bag. Much more often, he's empathizing with kids' feelings without trying to connect them to an explanation of something grown up. Well, everybody has different outlooks as they go to make-believe and as they live in their own homes, too. I suppose we're gonna have to wait till tomorrow to find out more. Even though there's less explaining, the people we meet are a lot weirder. In the first episode, we go visit a woman named Mrs. Russellite. And who is Mrs. Russellite? Well, of course, she's a neighbor whose hobby is collecting lampshades to wear on her head. And she's pretty into it, too. Earlier in the program, she blew off a visit to Mr. Rogers' house because she was too busy dusting them. This feels pretty different. We're not visiting a factory or a dairy farm or any kind of workplace. We don't get any reasons for Mrs. Russellite's eccentric behavior. But she's actually very patient and happy to show off her collection to someone as appreciative as Mr. Rogers. And then some people gave them to me, too. You know, that they know that I save them. Yeah. And so they, and that I collect them. And so they... They, these aren't ones that go on for real lamps anymore. Oh, Those, they? no, I have lampshades on my lamps here, but they stay. I see. These are just ones that nobody oh. uses anymore. And how do you like this one? Looks Watch. mighty heavy. And she also connects her love of collecting to her childhood in a way that feels comforting. 
Did you do that when you were a little girl? I mean, did you put on all kinds of clothes? Oh, sure. I had, um, my mother used to save her curtains and that, you know, and I'd mm -hmm. play bride, and I'd wear shoes. Mrs. Russellite is inexplicable, but she's a lot like Mr. Rogers. She's imaginative and kid-friendly. But some characters are inexplicable in a way that's not pleasant at all. Remember Mr. McFeely, who would deliver those videos and patiently stay to narrate them? Yeah, he's here in these episodes, but he's not exactly what anyone would call patient. You can almost feel Mr. Rogers tense up whenever he walks in, and then there's that flighty, dissonant music on the piano to match. Hey, Mr. Rogers, haven't time to stand here and talk, but I'll be back someday. He makes his deliveries and then moves on, without giving Mr. Rogers any time to think or even get a word in edgewise. The sad thing is, it seems like Mr. Rogers really wants to get to know him, but Mr. McFeely doesn't give him that chance. There's the four. I think you must be on the oh, can't you stay? No, no, no. All he can do is commiserate with us once Mr. McFeely is gone. Do you know anybody who's always in a hurry? Mr. McFeely seems to be always on the go. As an adult watching this, it occurs to me that there are a lot of possible explanations for why Mr. McFeely might always be in a hurry. Maybe he's got demanding clients or bosses. Maybe his income depends on a strict schedule. But Mr. Rogers chooses not to explain this. It's as if any system that leads Mr. McFeely to behave this way is not worth learning about, not worth defending. One other kind of subtle thing I noticed about Mr. McFeely. Each day, he charges Mr. Rogers for the delivery. And, and return message is two today, Mr. Oh, two. Rogers. All right. All right. There's well, a two. Thank you, speed of delivery. And you notice he doesn't mention dollars, just numbers. Since I started working on this video, I've gotten really into like the make-believe world building. I kind of want to figure out X the Owl's Correspondence School curriculum. Owl Correspondence School, dear OCS, we do our lessons and we get a U or S, we hope for an S. So and see if there's like inflation in make-believe currency. But sorry, this isn't film theory. This is video essayist wannabe town. The point is that in these early episodes, we are in the same world as the neighborhood of make-believe. This is less vlog and more mockumentary web series like Lizzie Bennet Diaries or Lonely Girl 15. We do not get the same distinction between real and pretend. You can see this in episode two where Lady Aberlin comes by for a visit. Her uncle, King Friday, is doing some scary things in the neighborhood of make-believe, and she's going to confront him about it. Mr. Rogers gives her a cape, so she'll feel braver on her way. And not only can make-believe characters visit, he can talk to them through a tin can phone. Here he's talking to Edgar, one of the puppet characters. He can also look out at make-believe through a special telescope. Let's see if it's peaceful or not in there. And the trolley still takes us there, but there's no indication that anyone, especially Mr. Rogers, is controlling it. It's moving by itself. And the situation in make-believe is not great. This week's ongoing story is that Lady Elaine, the mischievous museum manager, has used some kind of witchcraft to change the positions of all the buildings. King Friday has responded by basically turning the neighborhood into a police state. He's conscripted some of his subjects to stand in front of his castle as border guards. He wears a helmet over his crown with 13 stars on it. He is King Friday the 13th, after all. I like to imagine the prop person sticking those 13 tiny little stars on it. Anyway, in his mind, he's at war. In these episodes, he's not patient and not open to suggestions. When Lady Aberlin pleads with him to stop worrying so much, he immediately drafts her. Oh, great uncle, what? Just because Lady Elaine made a few changes is no reason for you to set up border guards. There may be other changers, and I refuse to let them come in. So you have come during have a state of emergency, Lady Abelin, and I have drafted you. He makes her take off the cape Mr. Rogers gave her to make her feel brave and assigns her an army uniform. Not only won't he listen to reason, 
he puts his comfort over hers. As the king's paranoia gets worse and worse all week, he continues to put his feelings over his friends. In episode 3, Chef Brockett bakes him a cake, and he basically makes Lady Aberlin destroy it as a security check. I want to smell oh. to see if there are any poisonous materials. Chef Brockett made the cake as a gift, and understandably, he's really hurt. But it's No thank you, I don't feel like eating anything oh, right now. But if King Friday really won't listen to anyone and won't empathize with any of his friends, how does the neighborhood of make-believe actually get him to stop? And so many people have had their feelings hurt. Oh, well, they resist. Lady Aberlin and some of the puppets release balloons that say things like togetherness and peaceful coexistence, and they float over to the castle. Before he reads the messages, King Friday tries to order the guards to shoot the balloons down. King Friday! And your... Paratroopers! And your man the... Man the... No, 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 no. But just in time, he figures out what they are, and that his subjects demand peace. Since we're actually in the same world as the neighborhood of make-believe, the make-believe segments are more than just thought experiments that lead into a lesson. They're Mr. Rogers' actual friends in a time of crisis. In the second episode, Mr. Rogers talks about his worry. Well, I hope all goes well in there this evening. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because it is kind of scary when people get up to, think, you know, play like that. You can't be exactly sure, can you? He's doing a lot less explaining and a lot more feeling in real time. The characterization and the story these early episodes tell create a very different message than the one we learned at the dairy farm. In these episodes, there are grown-ups whose behavior doesn't make sense. Sometimes those people are participating in oppressive systems, like Mr. McFeely, but sometimes those people are the ones in power, like King Friday. Sometimes those people hurt other people. And sometimes those people won't listen to reason and need to be peacefully challenged. In these episodes, the adult world can be scary. It's not something that can always be explained or that adults will have ready answers for. And it's not always something that you can or should play a part in as you grow. It might be something that you need to resist or try to change. There are still patient adults, especially Mr. Rogers himself but he's more of a refuge from the outside world than an ambassador to it. Though the messages from the Dairy Farm episode and from this early week are quite different, I don't necessarily think they completely contradict each other. To some extent, you do need to learn about how the world works in order to function within it. I do wonder, though, whether these early episodes as a statement about the world are more radical that powerful people or social structures can do indefensible things, and that reasoning or sharing your feelings with those in power won't necessarily lead to change. As adults watching Mr. Rogers, we need to ask ourselves, where might we find the people who will take time to answer our questions and help us process our feelings? Who are the people who we know can't be reasoned with? And in what ways are those people abusing their power? There's a lot more to think about here. I think you could ask a lot more questions about historical context. King Friday's War on Change was filmed at the height of the Vietnam War, while the Dairy Farm episode first aired during the Reagan administration. But here's what I think we need to take away. As he wraps up the storyline about King Friday, Mr. Rogers says this. Looked to me as if King Friday was very, very pleased that peace had come too. I was surprised to hear him say that, because that's not the impression I got at all. When the war ends, I didn't get any indication that King Friday was happy. The story ends with the king and Lady Elaine, who caused all of the change in the first place, grudgingly sitting down for peace talks. Well, it's all your fault, Lady Elaine. The king has just been pressured into giving up a lot of the sources of his own comfort. His checkpoint, his border guards, his barbed wire fence. He seems frustrated and probably embarrassed, but Mr. Rogers says that King Friday is happy. It's as if there's a sort of true happiness beyond someone's emotions in the moment in doing the right thing, even if that means giving up a lot of power. I think Mr. Rogers wants King Friday to be happy. 
He never stops believing in liking people just the way they are, even the most difficult people in the neighborhood. And that's what makes the political message of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood so complex. How do you practice kindness and empathy towards people who've been abusive or hateful while also working to take away their power? What? What? What do you think? What do you think is important? Really? What? What? What do you think? What do you think really counts? What do you think about other people? What do you think about new ideas? What? What? What do you think? What do you think?